I see on the wall that there's no clock, but my watch says it's seven. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, well, we, we have to start at seven, not 701, not 659. Uh, y'all, did y'all hear about uh, what happened up at uh, 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 Barrel, Alaska this morning? Uh, Barrel, Alaska, as far as you can go north. And uh, temperature there gets down to about 70 below. And there were two guys around a barrel that were burning fuel to keep warm. And one of them was from Texas, and another guy was from Alaska, and they were talking. And the guy from Alaska said, man, I've never been this cold before. And the guy from Texas said, well, you've never been to Amarillo, Texas then. <laughs> there you go. Somebody got it. Glad you're here tonight. A couple of announcements we need to make. First of all, Britt uh, is out for a couple of weeks. He has, he's been diagnosed with uh, COVID, and so has uh, Lisa. We will keep them in our prayers. Also, tonight we start a new quarter, and a new classes are supposed to start tonight. And uh, my class is just a continuation of what we've been doing in here. And Brett was supposed to start uh, Daniel, or a study of Daniel tonight. And uh, I couldn't get anybody volunteer to teach that. So I guess the class will be in here tonight. Hopefully uh, when Brett uh, gets well, he'll be back. We can uh, start up the class on Daniel. And we'll have our two classes on Wednesday night. So tonight... We're all going to be in here, so all five of us, so it is cold, but it is good to see you here, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we're going to be led in a song, we'll have our Devo thought, and then we'll get into our class. Seven eighteen. Seven eighteen. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the So oftentimes we hear the phrase, praise the Lord. <laughs> and I wonder what people really are thinking when they say that. Just how meaningful is the statement that we say, praise the Lord. You know, we have a beautiful song in our songbook, by the way, it's song number three. And the words read as follows. 
It says, Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels, praise, proclaim. All his hosts together, praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praises give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Them forever he established. His decree shall ever stand. From the earth, O praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons all. Fire and hail and snow and vapors. Stormy winds that hear him call. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes great earth judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. The songwriter, William J. Kirkpatrick, lifted the words of that song from a chapter that we find in the book of Psalms, Psalm 148. Notice, if you will, if you have your Bibles open there, Psalm 148 and verse 13. Because if you read the psalm and you come to this verse, verse 13 says it all. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. As the songwriter sings or says in this, this song that we just looked at, Every element of creation that God had made praised his name. We too today, as children of his, should praise his name and his name alone because the psalmist says his name alone is exalted. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the time that we're here together tonight. We ask that you be with our teachers and be with those involved in our Bible classes Father, we're just so thankful for those that are here tonight that are yearning to learn and yearning to take in the nourishment of, of your word. We ask that you bless our time together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Without my, there we go. Thank you. We are starting the Christian age tonight, but actually we're not getting into the Christian age per se. We're getting into what's going to be the Christian age that begins at the, uh, in the book of uh, Acts chapter 2. But in order to get there, we need to do a little bit of review. Remember last week we got to where we had the, the, the uh, kingdom divided. Uh, the ten tribes went north, and there's some things I need to tell you about that right quick before we get into tonight's lesson. Uh, the ten tribes that went north uh, eventually uh, married, remarried, and got into all kinds of things, and they got into the culture to the point to where they lost their identity. Uh, eventually they became known as the Samaritans. Now, if you remember, Jesus told a story about a Samaritan. We call it the Good Samaritan. Well, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews that had stayed south. And that the ones that stayed south, were they were called Judah. And actually it was the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, along with the Levites, that stayed south. The other ten tribes went north. They followed Jeroboam, and Jeroboam introduced all kinds of false worship, and uh, they built temples or places of worship, if you will, and he tried to keep the people there, and eventually they lost their identity. And that is why the tribe of Judah, or, or the 
Judah did not like the Samaritans because they represented those who did not stay true to God. The two tribes that stayed south were Judah and Benjamin. You remember Paul talking about in Philippians where he said, if you want, I got something to brag about if I'm going to brag. And one of the things he mentioned, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. So he is a faithful Jew, okay? That meant a lot to them. But eventually, even the tribes that stayed south went into captivity, Babylonian captivity. They came back out of captivity, rebuilt Jerusalem, rebuilt the walls, uh, repaired the temple. And all during that period, we have the period of the kings, the kings in the north, known as Israel. And so when you're reading the Old Testament, especially the prophets, if you will notice, it will say the prophet was speaking to Israel or the prophet was speaking to Judah. Well, if it says Israel, they're talking to the 10 tribes that went north and trying to bring those people or keep those people faithful to God. Judah stayed south. Now, Judah had her prophets also. There was in Ezekiel a prophecy that God is going to bring the two back together, and he had the names of two different sticks. And they're going to come back together, and they're going to be together under one king. Now, there is a whole religion in the United States built on that fact or on what they think that is saying. That religion is Mormonism. They say the ten tribes that were lost were actually the Indians. The they, Indians came over and they eventually, or the, the, the Israel came over and it became the Indians and that's a little bit of what the Book of Mormon is supposedly about. And they are looking for this time when God's going to bring them all back together under one king. There's only one problem, that prophecy has been fulfilled already. That king is Jesus. And remember what Jesus said to the disciples in Acts 2? You will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the earth. Yes, sir. The other problem is, is they cannot find any historical proof. Oh, <laughs> There, there's absolutely nothing in the Book of Mormon that can be verified by historical fact or even uh, uh, diggings and, and geologists can't even find anything to, to prove that the thing is. By the way, there's supposed to be elephants and all kinds of weird animals supposed to be here also, but are not. But the point I'm making is this. That prophecy was fulfilled because... Where was Antioch? Antioch was in Samaria. Antioch was the church that supported Paul that sent Paul where? All over to, to bring the Gentiles to Christ. So there you are under one king, Jesus so, yeah, that has already been fulfilled. And I wanted to just briefly give that to you because there's a whole lot of false teaching going on today about the second coming of Christ in the end times. And I don't have time to go back through the book of Revelation. But let me tell you, that all has been fulfilled. Matter of fact, New Testament says all has been fulfilled through Christ. So Christ has fulfilled all prophecies. There's only one prophecy left to be fulfilled, and that is his coming back and judgment. Everything else has been fulfilled. All right, with that in mind, let's now get to the time when the, the prophets were talking about a time when one would come. They really weren't sure who they were talking about, but they knew one like the Son of Man. He was called a Son of Man several times in the Old Testament, especially in Daniel. He's referred to as the Son of Man who's going to come and he's going to put things back the way they should be. And by the way, 
things being the way they should be, it means what? We're back in relationship with God. That's what things should be. And that's what Jesus has done. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at Isaiah for a moment. In Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah is prophesying. And he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. This is about 400 years before Christ was born. We read in Luke 1, 31 to 33, which by the way, about this time of the year, what are people celebrating? Well, guess what? You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. This was a prophecy that was fulfilled in Christ. Now, one of the things people look for all the time is signs for the end of time. Well, Isaiah gave a very clear, specific sign. Now, is this the first time in the Bible, is, is Isaiah 7.14 the first time in the Bible where we read this is going to happen? Be careful how you answer that question because this is a trick question. Remember the third chapter of Genesis? The seed of woman. Everywhere in the Bible, it's the seed of man. But the first time it's mentioned, it's the seed of woman shall bear a son. The seed of woman is going to stomp the head of Satan. And so this is not the first prophecy. This is just giving a little bit more information about the first prophecy which was given to us in Genesis about Christ coming and his going to put together what has been broken. And that is our relationship with God. In Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 12, and by the way, I want you to know this did not happen on the 25th of December. That, that is not the date that all of this took place. More than likely, it was in the spring or in the fall. But uh, it was not the 25th of December. Yes, go ahead. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Christmas and Easter are celebrated on the same day by the Azerbaijan. Yes. Right. And they, uh, and they believe the, that the wise men, in fact, were from them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and by the way, uh, how old was Jesus when they showed up? He was about two years old. He was about two. It wasn't the night that he was born that they show up. And uh, we, we, hear the, we hear the three wise men. Were there three? Well, there were three gifts. We just know it just says there were wise men and there were three gifts that they have brought. So I, I think this is something else that's interesting. They brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All three are very valuable now, where is Jesus going to spend the next few years of his life with his family? In Egypt. They are going to be foreigners in a foreign land, and they're not going to be able probably to get jobs as easy as the Egyptians, so they're going to need some coin. They're going to need support. They're going to need some way to have uh, a decent life until they can get back to, to Israel. And so what do they do? Or get back to Judah. So what do they do? God provides. And isn't it interesting? It was Gentiles that provided it. God used the Gentiles, the gift of the Gentiles, to support Mary and Joseph while they are 
in exile, if you will, until they can return home. So we have this, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause you great joy for all the people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is a Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. So here we have now the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise made back in Genesis chapter 3. What has been the story all the way from Genesis? God's going to provide a Savior. This Savior is going to be in war against the evil one. The evil one will hurt him, but he is going to destroy the evil one. Well, there you have it. God does not forget his promises. God keeps his word. And we see him bringing this out. And so in Luke 2, 40, 42, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up the festival according to, his, to the custom. I don't know that much, and I don't think anybody really knows that much about the early years of Jesus other than we have this story. Now, somebody, have, let's see, what was the name of that? There was a radio station out of, oh, good man, oh, Dalhart, Texas, that had the Midnight Preacher. Have y'all ever heard the Midnight Preacher? Well, I, I was driving one time, and I turned it on, and this midnight preacher, he had the wildest, the wildest sermon I've ever heard in my life. And the sermon was basically, when did Jesus know he was God? <laughs> so, well, it gave us something to think about. Yeah, and, but I know this. At least at age 12, Jesus knew a whole lot to the point to where he was astounding the wise people. He was making the preachers think. He was saying some things that got their attention. Now, how much did he know about everything? I don't know, and that's only speculation, but here's what we have. In those days, John the Baptist, by the way, was John prophesied that would come. There was one that was going to come out of the wilderness, and he was going to make a way for the Savior, and he was going to be like who? One like one of the prophets, Elijah. What made, as a matter of fact, Elijah had been dead for a long time. As a matter of fact, all the people that heard John had never heard Elijah, and yet he comes preaching like Elijah. How did they know he was preaching like Elijah? What is it? I think it's what he was saying. Evidently, there hadn't been a preacher in Judah for a long time that preached the way Elijah did. And one day, John shows up, and he's preaching like Elijah. In other words, what's his, you remember what his, well, let's just say, what was his message? Verse 2. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is coming. How much preaching on repentance do we hear? What is repentance? What is he, when, when the prophets are calling people to repent, what's he saying? What are they saying? What is John telling these people? He's telling them, you better get prepared. The kingdom of God is coming. The Messiah is coming. And he said, you better repent. Now it says, this was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, voice of one calling wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. This is a man who is preaching like one of the prophets, and they haven't heard this kind of preaching in years. Well, actually, it's been 400 years since they've heard this kind of preaching. These people living at this time had never heard it. They have read it. They've got it, 
They can read it. And so when you go and you start reading Elijah and the things he preached, wow. He called the people to repentance. And here comes John preaching like him. And so in Matthew, Jesus comes to him. Now, I, I really want to just bear down on this one. In Matthew 3, 13 through 16, John is going out and he's preaching and he's baptizing people. Now, let's stop and think for a moment. He is baptizing people. When was baptism ever a part of being a Jew? The mark of a Jew was not baptism, but what? Circumcision. Baptism is something that's been added between the Old and New Testament. Baptism came about about 150 to 200 years before Christ came. And the Jews started baptizing Gentiles if the Gentile wanted to become a Jew. They added that. It was a cleansing ceremony, actually, is what they called it. It was just a, a cleansing ceremony where they cleanse you. And what it was doing, what this baptism meant to these Gentiles and to the Jews is you are renouncing your life as it was before and you are now to begin a new life as a Jew. Now, you need to understand how Jews looked at Gentiles. There were three ways they looked at them. By the way, we read all three in the New Testament. First of all, there was a Gentile who didn't believe in God or did not believe in the Jewish God or did not acknowledge a Jewish God. They called them pagans. Then there was the Gentile that they, they would call them a convert. And a convert is one who, a Gentile who has accepted the law lives under the law, and has been circumcised. Then there was the God-fearer. The God-fearer is one who lives by the law, acknowledges there is the one God of Israel, but they are not circumcised. They are called God-fearers. That is interesting because Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, what's he called? A God-fearer. He prayed to God. He gave alms to God and gave alms to people. There was something about the law that this soldier who has now been stationed in that part of the world, there's something about Judaism he likes because as a Roman, he was never taught the things he's doing praying to God, giving alms to people, helping the poor. All of that is foreign to Roman religion. So he has become a God-fearer. All right. The reason I say all of that is because when we get to the New Testament, and especially when we get to what Jesus is doing here, Baptism meant to a Jew, you are renouncing your former life. Who is John baptizing? Jews. You know what they're renouncing? They're renouncing their former life. As what? They're looking now for the kingdom of God. There's something new here. John is preaching something they've never heard before. He is making the way for Christ. These people are believing this message, and they are renouncing their past for a new life. Now, that was something that Jews didn't normally do. That was only for Gentiles. And John comes along, and evidently his message is hitting home and hitting hard. 
So listen what happens. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Well, baptism is for Gentiles. But these Jews are now being baptized, and here comes Jesus. And he comes to be baptized, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you, and, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and alighting on him. Now, let's stop and, and analyze what's just happened. Jesus, who has nothing to repent of because he hasn't sinned, comes to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. If you want to know what righteousness and perfection looks like, look at Jesus. And yet, what does he do? He submits. He submits to baptism. But not only that, let's see what happens. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. What? happened when Jesus came up out of the water. Well, John says, first of all, he saw the Spirit in the form of a dove come down on Jesus. What else happened when Jesus was baptized? you remember anything else that happened? Did, was there any voices from heaven or anything? God said what? This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Okay, let's do some critical thinking here. First of all, an angel appears and tells Zechariah, there's going to be, you're not going to, you're, you're, you're going to see the Son of God. Then comes to Mary, Mary, you're going to have a baby He's going to be the Son of God. So the angel announces it. John says, uh, this is the Son of God coming to me to be baptized. Everybody's saying this is the Son of God except God. And God didn't say it until when? After he was baptized. I think that's significant, folks. I don't think that's by accident that it happened that way. The angel said this is God's son. The prophet said this is God's son. The people were saying this is the son of God. Mary knew it was the son of God. Joseph knew it was the son of God. But God doesn't say it until he's baptized. Now, I'm going to draw a conclusion. You can claim to be a child of God. People around you can say, that's a child of God. The world can look at you and say, you're a child of God. But if you haven't been baptized, you're not hearing it from God. And by the way, it's only his voice that counts. So don't, don't, don't advertise yourself as a child of God unless you have done what the Son of God did. So I just thought I would throw that in there. To me, that's just something to think about. And I think it's not by accident that it happened that way. Continuing on, when morning came, 
In Luke, he calls his disciples to him and chose 12 of them. What did Jesus do before he chose his disciples? You remember what he did the night before? He prayed. He prayed all night long, evidently. And then he starts choosing his disciples. So he's born. At age 12, he's astonishing the religious leaders. At age 30, he is, submits to baptism. And of all the people in the world that's ever been baptized, he's the only one that didn't need it. But he did it anyway. And I think there's a reason, another reason for that. Jesus has never asked us to do anything that he didn't do first. And so he did. Now, he's choosing his disciples. Why did he wait until age 30 before he started his ministry? Sounds to me like about age 12 he could have gotten started. There's, there's something going on in Jewish culture. Until you reach age 30, they really don't listen to you. Yeah, you don't become a teacher until you're age 30. Now, I don't know who wrote that law, but evidently it's got to be somewhere in the Bible. Either that or he's working within the custom in which he has been called. Because really, even if he could have at age 12 started, they wouldn't have listened. They didn't think he was qualified. I think it's also interesting that when he goes out and chooses his disciples, I, I, let, let's think about this for a second. Let's say that you, are, you have been commissioned by God to start a movement called the church. And God says, I want you to choose 12 men who can help you with this endeavor because I want you to spend three years with them, training them so that they will go out and be able to impact the world with the gospel of Christ. Where is the first place most people would go to find those 12 men? Some Christian university or preaching school. Jesus didn't go to any of the rabbis. He didn't go to any of their schools. As a matter of fact, he went and found men where? Working, fishing. These guys are doing everything but going to school. These are not what you would call learned men. These are not the scholars of the day. Why did Jesus do that? I think there's a good reason behind it, just if nothing else for common sense, but why did Jesus not go to the rabbis and get the top students for his 12 disciples? God loves to use the ones the world would call least likely to do his greatest work through. God loves to confound the wise, and he did it that way. He got the least likely people in the world. I think there's another reason. Um, I really wanted to start being a preacher when I got out of uh, when I, when I got my first degree, but I was already in the Air Force, so I decided to stay in for 20 years and at least finish that up. I realized something. When I got out of college, I wasn't ready. You see, I had all the answers, but I didn't have any experience. I didn't know how to deal with people. And what I discovered is when you're preaching and when you're teaching, if you don't have a common experience with people, it's hard to communicate. And I will tell you where I learned that. I learned it sitting in college, listening to professors who had never done anything in their life but teach. Now, I'm not going to say that their education was wasted. I'm just going to say they wasted their time getting their education because they didn't complete it. They got the book learning, but they never got into the world. They never knew what most people deal with on a daily basis at Walmart 
as yeah exactly as a matter of fact here's what I used to tell my students at LCU when you get that degree in your hand if you walk out of here thinking you have all the answers we have failed you what you should learn when you get that degree in your hand what you should know above all else is just how much you don't know about what you've been studying now it's time to go apply it. Go out there in the world and now apply what you have learned and add to it because all you've learned here is just how much you don't know. Go out there and learn the rest. So Jesus doesn't go to the universities. He goes to the fishing docks. He goes to the marketplace he calls this old guy that I would, did you know he got a guy from the IRS? That's the last place I'd go. I could, you, you can't trust the IRS. Call him and try to get an answer. That, he got a Tea Party guy too. That's exactly right. He sure did. I mean, Judas Iscariot. Boy, I mean, you don't talk. Man. Matter of fact, he had both ex ex extremes in his group. Simon, that, I'm telling you, he got the most unlikely group of people I've ever seen in my life. And yet, why did he do that? First of all, to confound the wise, to show what God can do. Where man says, well, if you're going to do it, get the PhD, Jesus went and got those who don't even qualify to go to school much less. I mean, their, their SAT scores would be through, through the bottom. Exactly. Right. As a matter of fact, one, uh, the, when Jesus went to talk to the know-it-alls, what the know-it-alls didn't know is that they didn't know it all. And he couldn't teach them anything. They were too learned in their own minds and in their own opinions. So Jesus takes these men and he names them here who they were. And what happens is these people can talk to the common man. And what is interesting is later on, we're going to learn something about some of these guys. They, they've been with Jesus. Matter of fact, one of them is going to be standing by a fire with a little girl one night, and he's going to try to deny it, and he can't hide it. He's been with Jesus. And even though he denies Jesus, he's a changed man. Yes, God loves to work with those who know they don't know it all and are willing to learn it. So don't be too intimidated by other things. Now, Jesus lived under the law. Here's something that we need to really get nailed down. He said, when the, time, when, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that he might receive adoption to son, that they might, we might receive adoption as sonship. Jesus lived and died under the law of Moses. What surprises me is how many don't know that. It really surprises me that a lot of people do not know that Jesus lived under the law of Moses. A lot there, I have, don't know how many Bible studies I've had with people, people who've been in religious organizations for years thinking that Jesus started the church when he was on the earth. He didn't. Jesus was never a member of any of the congregations that have been established that wear his name. Now, he's the head, but physically he never in flesh and blood ever attended a service of a church of Christ. Never did. 
And he, but he hadn't missed a Sunday. That's right. He's, he's there every time they get together because he said he would be. Two or three gathered together in my name. I'm going to be there. He even went further. He said, by the way, when you do this every week, I'm going to be right there with you at the table. So he's been there every Sunday since, but not in flesh and blood. Never attended a church service as we know it. Now, he did attend synagogues until he finally got cut, uh, thrown out of them. And, uh, we'll get into that later. Now, here's a confusing statement. Jesus said in Matthew 5, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, if Jesus lived and died under the law, and if Jesus is saying here the law will never disappear, then we're still under Moses. Is that what he was saying here? Actually, the word is he, the law will, uh, it will not disappear until everything is fulfilled. What's the last words that Jesus used or that Jesus said from the cross? It is finished. He did it. He did not abolish the law. The law now has been set aside for him. As a matter of fact, I think this is the next one. Let's go here. In Matthew 4, Jesus went through our Galilee uh, teaching in synagogues proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Let's stop right there. Where in the Old Testament do we have the phrase good news of the kingdom? Jesus is introducing something new that's coming. We are the kingdom of God. What does the word kingdom mean? That, the problem we deal with here is how many of us understand the concept of kingdom? We don't live under a kingdom. We live under a republic government. But a kingdom involves a king. It involves subjects. It involves territory. And it involves law. And yes, Jesus has all of those. He is the king. We are the subjects. The earth is the territory where we now live, and we live under Christ and his law. He has replaced the law of Moses with something better. What has he replaced the law of Moses with? Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he explains it so, so well. Uh, you have heard it said, do not kill. Can anybody finish that? But, I tell you, you've heard it said, do not steal. You have heard it said, do not covet. He, he covers all of that in this phrase. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But, I say, don't even lust. What's he addressing here that the law did not address? The heart. The law took care of the action, didn't it? Don't kill. You remember what, if you were here Sunday morning, you remember what I said? Tell somebody don't steal no more. Okay, but are they fulfilled? Okay, I stopped stealing. Are they fulfilled? No. You remember Jesus said something about you clean out a house and you sweep it out and you get rid of all the COVID and all the germs and stuff in it. But he said, if you leave it empty, what's going to happen? Seven times as much that you took out are going to come back in. It's going to be even worse. You don't empty your life of all the bad stuff and then set. You have to fill it with something. And who fills it? He does. When you were saying that Sunday morning, I just thought about what Paul said in the very beginning of Ephesians. And he said, he bestows, he steals, he sends you the word, and he said, work this into you. That's right. So he gave him something to fill up. That's right. 
if you do you've been stealing, don't steal anymore, but work with your hands. Okay, stop doing this and start doing this. That's how he fulfills us. He gives us. And he preached and he healed and he healed sicknesses. But I want to tell you something. Jesus healed, but he didn't come to this world to heal everybody. Did you know when Jesus died, there were still sick people that still hadn't been healed? Did you know that when Jesus died, there were still lame that were still lame? Did you know there were still blind people that never got healed when Jesus died? What kind of healing is he trying to proclaim ultimately? Our biggest problem is not the affliction of the body. It's the affliction of the soul. That's what he came to heal. So Jesus is teaching and preaching the kingdom of God. Now, he promises the kingdom, which is the church, in Matthew 16, or Matthew 18, I don't know where that 6, 16 came from. He says, but if they will not listen, take one or two along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth would be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth would be loose in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Jesus promised the church. Here, Jesus tells us something about the church and especially the apostles. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What does that mean? Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Does that mean that, hey, let's two of us get together and, uh, you know, we don't like what the Bible says about this, so we'll change it. And now we agree on it, so now it's changed in heaven. Is that what he said? Nope, that's not what he's saying. The apostles are going to carry out the mission of the church by establishing it by the authority of Christ. And their word is going to be the same as the word of God. That's the first point. The second point is interesting. If two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. If you and I get together and we agree that we both need a new Mercedes and we agree to that, is that what he's saying? We're going to get it? He is talking in terms of the kingdom of God and her mission. So let's readjust our thinking. What do we need to do his will in this church? What do we need to do and get together and agree on that God wants done here in this church? Now, this really applied to the apostles, but I think in a secondary mean it applies to us. Jesus never said he will give us whatever we ask for in his name. He said whatever we need, he will give us. And what do we need more than anything else? Brethren, let's face it, most of us don't need another meal for a while. Most of us don't need a lot of things we ask for. What do we actually need to do God's will? Mercy. I need mercy. I need to be merciful. I need to be more loving. I need to be more sympathetic. I need to be more caring. I need more patience. I need a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God that I think is a need which isn't. Pardon? Brother, I need to be rebuked right now so bad. 
I just hope and pray when the time comes when y'all rebuke me, you'll remember the words of Jesus. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. So be real kind to me when you rebuke me. Yeah. That's right. That's it. That's right. That's right. There you go. There you go. And by the way, all of this was decided in heaven long before Jesus said it. It was decided in heaven before God said, let there be light. And what was decided? Well, I think what Chris saying there and, and is a real, real uh, powerful point. When somebody falls, we need to gently pick them up. And when they're restored, remember, they're standing before God just as pure as you think you are. So we must accept. Matter of fact, Paul had to deal with that at the church of Corinth, didn't he? That's where it is right there. There it is. Yeah. I mean, it's already been decided. It's already been decided. Now, let's do this one last one, and we'll call it quits here tonight. He said to them, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. What had Jesus been preaching the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, as far as I know, he only had one title for every sermon, the kingdom of God. Every sermon was titled the kingdom of God. It's coming. It's here. It's in you. It's going to be uh, spread throughout the whole world. Uh, the apostles, I mean, it's all there. Now then, he's talking to the apostles. Now, here's why this is a very important point. There are those today who say that the kingdom has yet to come and it will come when Jesus returns. It's called premillennialism. Well, let me tell you something. If what Jesus said here is true, and if premillennialism is true, then there's some apostles running around somewhere on this earth that are over 2,000 years old because Jesus said they would not die until they see the kingdom of God come. Either he was mistaken, he lied, or somebody's got bad theology. Now, I'm not going to argue with Jesus. He said the kingdom would come in their lifetime. When did the kingdom of God fully come down? Hint. It's in the book of Acts. Day of Pentecost. That lady knows the Bible. Thank you. The day of Pentecost, the kingdom of God fully came with the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice what he said. The kingdom of God has come with power. And when the Holy Spirit came down upon those apostles, there's the power. They spoke and by the way, I don't think they were speaking in tongues. Everybody heard them in their own language. That's what it says. Everybody heard in their own language. By the way, there was about 17, I think, different languages that were represented there that day. And yet everybody heard in their own language. Now, you want to talk about power, pull that one off. Go try to do that. But not only that, here was the greatest power of all. 3,000 people for the first time since the fall of Adam and Eve stand pure, holy, and sinless before God because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There is the power of the gospel. 
the power to remove sins. What power, what a kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the power that you've demonstrated through the resurrection of Christ and in the gospel. Thank you, Father, for Jesus that made this possible through his sacrifice. And Father, we ask you to help us. Father, give us what we need. And Father, we need the boldness to speak out. Father, we need wisdom to know when to speak. And Father, we need your wisdom to know how to say it as we apply the words of your book we call the Bible, your word to a world that desperately needs to hear the gospel. Father, give us what we need in order to fulfill your mission. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it.